curved hems, rolled hems, pin hems, deep hems, all the hems and hemming techniques. There are so many hemming options to explore, but we have a few favorite tried and true techniques that we're going to talk about today. Hello, and welcome to Threaded Together, a podcast that stitches together home sewing and high fashion. We're your hosts. I'm Tracy. I'm Rebecca. And in today's episode, we will be discussing hems. This is our fifth episode for Threaded Together, and we are so excited to have you. And we're thrilled to have you back listening to us again. Today's episode is tackling hemming techniques that we have explored during our recent making adventures, as well as techniques that we've discovered while looking at some high fashion garments. This will not be an exhaustive list of hemming strategies. There's enough for several episodes, but these are techniques we have learned and rely on often, and we will also be sharing why they are our favorites. But first, Tracy, you have had such a busy, fashionable month since our last episode. Can you tell us all about it, please? (laughs) Well, I went to Paris for a weekend at the start of June, and I saw two exhibitions there. Um, that I highly recommend. One was 1997, Fashion Big Bang, which covers one of the biggest years in recent fashion history. So Alexander McQueen arriving at Givenchy, John Galliano at Christian Dior, and the emergence of rising talents such as Stella McCartney. And then also some of the historical events of that year, like the death of Versace and Princess Diana. I so, realized that was all in one year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I also went to La Galerie Dior, an absolutely incredible, incredible exhibition which I highly 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 recommend if you to visit if you're in Paris it's room after room of these most magical and beautiful Dior dresses it's so oh, wow. beautifully put together I went to the Dior exhibition at the V&A a few years ago and it's equal or better to that it's I, oh, wow. I shared some of, yeah it's incredible I shared some of the pictures I took whilst there on my Instagram <laughs> we may need to see some more of those I uh, but, so. now I, I, but I have a terribly unfair question for you Tracy if you only only had time to visit one of the exhibits, which one would you recommend? Oh, the Dior one. The Dior one was yeah. just incredible. Absolutely incredible. <laughs> We're really excited to talk about all things hems. And it's your most recent make that started us down that topic of hem research. Do you have any updates on your project, Tracy? <laughs> My escort dress. Um, this dress has caused me so much stress. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it went through like four twirls in calico before I then made a wearable one in viscous um, to basically have a better idea of how it draped. I think the stressful part um, was that I've coordinated the hat with the fabric and so whatever I made and however it turned out <laughs> I had to have something in that <laughs> fabric um, and, it, and it was um, sort of Liberty Silk uh, which <laughs> and you know I've made the pattern myself and so yeah it was so it was definitely a stressful <laughs> a stressful project I think I put a bit too much pressure on myself um, so I think my lesson learned from that is that next time I'm making an event dress I should have a backup ready or, <laughs> for, uh, or start it earlier <laughs> but it's turned out absolutely incredible Tracy and I know I've I've had the pleasure of getting to see all of the process pieces and it really uh, this is in my opinion designer level stuff Tracy if I may <laughs> say so you know from the twalling to the then the viscose and then the final it's absolutely phenomenal and the hat just makes it it's so striking <laughs> thank you so we need all the photos <laughs> of course <laughs> photos will will happen <laughs> and what have you been up to Rebecca Oh, well, I I finished quite a few things this past month, but not quite what I had planned. Um, Let's see, I ended up spending a lot of time reworking things I'd either partially begotten or had made incorrectly last year. In our last episode, I mentioned wanting to make a terry towel blue romper, but I had actually forgotten that I'd cut out and attempted to sew one last year only to completely botch the neckline due to having no stable stabilization in it and using a vintage terry towel fabric that stretched out and unraveled quite quickly. Um, So instead of starting from scratch, I unpicked it, stabilized it with some bias binding and wore it the other weekend for a little weekend holiday away, which was quite lovely. It was so much better than it was before, but I do think if I was going to do it one more time, I would use some elastic in the neckline, which would have been even better just due to the nature of the 
fabric kind of unraveling and stretching on the bias. Oh, wow. Well, how relevant, though. Stabilization <laughs> is something we are going to talk about today because it's so crucial to creating and holding a hem shape. That's that's right. I keep doing this on purpose, Tracy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> really on accident. But today we are going to be talking about hems. We're going to cover hems for knits, wovens, machine and hand sewn hems, and how to get the perfect hem. Choosing the right hem really depends on the fabric and the style of the garment. Typically, you want an even and inconspicuous hem. Unless the style of the garment means otherwise. There are complications and considerations that come with both hidden and very visible hems, and we'll be discussing those as well. There are faced hems, hems with a turned up edge, and hems that have an enclosed edge. And we'll talk about different techniques for each of these hem types today. How deep your hem should be will impact your hemming technique, and the proper depth depends on the fabric and how straight the garment is. According to the Regis Digest, as a general rule of thumb, the straighter the edge, the deeper the hem. And for a curvy edge, you want a shallower hem. Up first, we're going to discuss some heavier fabric hem techniques, since more often than not, that seems to be my personal default, Tracy. The <laughs> first technique is something that I've used on jumpsuits and all of my trousers. It's a personal favorite of mine to hem something, a blind hem. Blind hems are really good for deep hems on trousers or skirts is a near invisible stitch and it's created using a special foot and special stitch on your machine. The stitch looks like little zigzags in between big zigzags and the idea is that it does a tiny stitch into your main fabric every few stitches to hold the hem in place. I'm so happy that we started with a blind hem, Tracy. As we said, it's my favorite since I'm a trouser girl and I'm constantly making pants. It's also quick, clean, and you only need an iron and usually a blind hem foot, as you said, to have a very professional looking, almost invisible hem. To use this technique, you first need a decent amount of fabric to use for the hem because the key secret to the blind part of the hem is folding the fabric multiple times whilst doing the stitch. You will need to have your fabric trimmed to slightly longer than the length of your desired hem roughly one and a half times the length. For example, a two centimeter hem, you want your fabric trimmed to three centimeters from your desired hemline. Start with the right side of your fabric laying out on your table. So just basically your trouser leg laying flat on your ironing board. Fold the end of the hem under or inside so that the raw edge is enclosed, or you can also overlock the edge. If you're folding under, this should be roughly half of your extra space beyond your hem. So that extra one centimeter we were talking about. Once you've finished or folded in that small extra bit of fabric, next fold the remaining fabric at the hemline inwards one more time and lightly press. Then working with the back of the fabric, fold the hem back on itself so the hem is overlapping the fabric with your extra bit of length hanging over the fold and then press. Pin this and lastly turn your hem inside out and you will have a tiny lip on the edge of your hem that the stitch of the blind hem foot will sew along and then jump over to do a teeny pinprick stitch that becomes your hem in that zigzag shape. Once you have your blind hem, unfold, press one more time to to get rid of the creases and voila, a beautiful, almost invisible hem finishing. Now, I have to confess, anytime I sew a blind hem, I always have to dig out my manual or find a quick tutorial on YouTube. I can never remember the way I need to fold it. Same. Seam work have a really good tutorial on this where they've chalked all the lines, different colors, so it makes it really clear how it all comes together. And we'll link that in our show notes. We definitely will. I use exactly the same tutorial, Tracy. I love that it's actually written out on a website with photos because I prefer that sometimes uh, as opposed to the videos. I love their chalking technique. I do get confused on the folds without it. So it's you know, very much my go-to. And on my singer, I have two stitches for blind hems that actually go in different directions. So my test that I do is I'll actually take a spare piece of fabric, do the folds and all of the ironing just to triple check the actual stitch on that swatch before taking it to my final garment to make sure I'm not using the stitch in the wrong direction. Do you have similar options on your machine, Tracy? No, I've, I've 
just checked. I've only got one blind hem stitch on my machine really? that I can see. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> well, that must make it easier. So you're not trying to say, <laughs> do I need this one or this one when they go opposite directions? Going back to the blind hem technique itself, I have seen that on that very first step, you can also use bias binding on that end piece to give a clean uh. finish without losing any length to that piece that you would have otherwise uh, folded over. So that would replace the fold under in the first step or or if you were using a machine surged um, edge. And I found this out because I was actually letting out the hem on a pair of secondhand Gucci trousers for my mm -hmm. husband. And that was the technique was a blind hem. But that very first edge just had a lovely bit of bias binding on it. Uh, and it's a really great tip since just using a bias tape hem is also a good trick for bulkier fabrics. This is where you open the bias tape, stitch it, in the fold to the right side of the fabric, press it to the wrong side and then stitch the top of the tape to your garment. This encloses the raw seam and doesn't add any more bulk at all. Um, and I made the Diddy pullover by Fiber Mood out of this Sherpa fabric. Um, oh, I use this technique as well, basically a bias tape hem because the bulk of the Sherpa would have made for like a really chunky hem and it was um, not the look I wanted. That sounds lovely and how smart to create a clean finish without the bulk. I've used that technique as well, more so because I'm a surgerless sewer <laughs> currently. <laughs> um, and it does give you, as you said, a really easy, clean hem with minimal bulk. Now, Tracy, your ascot dress was a big motivation for the research behind this episode. Can you share a bit about what the challenges were and why you were looking at the next few hem techniques? Yes, my inspiration dress clearly had a horsehair or an organza hem to give it some shaping and structure. And mm. I was playing around on my dress with flounces and gathers on the bottom of the dress, which I would have had to approach the hem differently in both of those cases. I wanted something um, that would work with the delicateness of my fabric as well. And so I was just playing around with the different ideas to... Um, be true to my inspiration but also honor the fabric that I was working with. Mm, that makes perfect sense and I know this is one of the ideas that you you talked about so let's start with what a face hem might be um, and a face hem is a separate piece of fabric that is attached at the edge and then folded in as the hem allowance. Yes and this type of hem is useful because it adds some body to the hem helping with exaggerated or bouncy shapes and can it assist with creating a really crisp crisp hem where you can't see the fold of the hem at all. A hem facing is shaped so that it conforms to the grain line of the hem or it's a bias strip. And often a pattern that calls for a shaped hem facing will include the pattern pieces for this. So for example, the Fiber Mood Clio dress that I made a few months ago had this really mm -hmm. nice deep faced hem as part of the pattern pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but also you can make your own by tracing the hemline from the bottom of the pattern piece. Often a hem facing is done in the self fabric, but it's a really good technique to try out with other fabrics too. The power of a hem facing is that it not only stabilizes and reinforces the hem, but it can also create a new design and shaping details when the facing is a different weight than your original fabric. An option for an alternative hem facing is silk organza. We Our love favorite. organza. <laughs> <laughs> it has some shaping, a bit of body and weight. But you could also use canvas or muslin, depending on how much weight and shape you want to achieve. Another option that I always get so excited when I see in high fashion pieces is crinoline or even horsehair. This can give a really beautiful shaped hem that can almost look like it defies gravity and really gives that kind of 3D shaping effect. I'll never forget, I had the pleasure of seeing the Lava Fall Winter 22 collection in person, and they used crinoline under these stunning silk hems to create a bell shape on these dresses and it was nothing short of heavenly. Wow that sounds really beautiful and functional as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah amazing. So when working with horse hair braid depending on the width of it it may have a threaded edge for easing so you'll want to stitch the unthreaded edge to the hemline with the right sides together and stitch into place and then turn it up to the inside of the skirt and this is where you pull the threaded edge gently to ease it to the shape of the dress and then stitch it in place by hand with a catch stitch or top stitch it in place. 
Another trick when working with horse hair is to put a bind on the ends of it as it can, can be quite scratchy and you don't want it to poke through your fabric or scratchy even. So um, mm. some ribbon or some bias tape on that will do the trick. And when you're using a hem facing, you usually will still have to fold under your original hem slightly and line it up with the edge of the facing to create a clean, crisp edge. Yes. Now, Tracy, I know you thought about using a face hem on your dress. Was that what you decided on ultimately? No, I went with a rolled hem in the end. I thought that the silk on my dress was delicate and draped really nicely as it was, and that a rolled hem would be the best hem to work on it. So let's talk about that next. That sounds great. Another technique for more delicate fabrics, as you said, is a rolled hem where the fabric is turned under ever so slightly and finished with your stitch or technique of choice. It's a really ideal technique for lightweight fabrics because it's a very, very small hem with minimal bulk. You can do it with your overlocker. A rolled hem on your overlocker just uses your right needle and it creates a narrow thread wrapped edge. So you've probably seen this type of rolled hem where on the garment, you'll almost see a line of wrapped thread at the edge of the hem. Yeah. Rolled hems you'll often see on beautiful silk scarves as well. Though often they're hand stitched, the hems. Mm. I also read this is a great option for silk organza, which can almost be too delicate to fold completely sometimes. But I know as we were discussing, Tracy, this also can be a fairly obvious yes. uh, hem choice. So it it becomes, I guess, what we would call a design feature, <laughs> potentially. <laughs> um, you can also use your traditional sewing machine zigzag stitch to create something that looks very similar to what an overlocker can accomplish. And you can also do it on your sew sewing machine with a special rolled hem foot as it feeds the fabric through. It's like a spiral. It rolls it under to form a narrow rolled hem. It takes a bit of practice and it's a bit fib fiddly to get started. But once you have the hang of it, it really, really does create a beautiful hem. You have to work on the back of the fabric and fold over the hem. And as the foot takes the fabric in, the spiral and the foot turns it again and it creates, it's so beautiful, such a beautiful, neat hem. Um, and when you're doing it again, you, it's one of these ones that you definitely need to practice before you start it. You have to be for sure that you're feeding in the right amount because if it's too much, you'll end up with fabric coming out of the roll and too little and you won't get enough of a fold. Um, mm. So, yeah, on my... Uh, my ascot dress my head's about four meters long I think it's, a, oh, wow. it's quite, quite a lot for a consistently perfect rolled hem but I think it was okay <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it looks amazing and do you know how many <laughs> how many millimeters wide that rolled hem was uh, uh whatever it was on my foot <laughs> I don't know <laughs> it's got to be like two or three millimeters it's really really oh small. wow so the rolled hem you can also do by hand um and we'll touch on that later when we have a look at some of the hand spraying hem techniques. And for more on rolled hem techniques, I really like the resource of mellysews.com as they have three ways to accomplish a rolled hem, including a tutorial. And you have to love that. So we will add that in link in the show notes. And a pin hem is another option for a really narrow hem. And Tracy, I always thought a pin hem was a type of rolled hem. Yeah, pretty much. You just don't need a special foot. Hmm. Much like a rolled hem, you achieve this by folding up your hem and stitching as close as possible to the fold, then trimming as close to the stitch as possible, and then fold it again and stitch. So you end up with a, 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 a very thin hem, a pin hem. Hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you can don't you don't need a special foot. Um, Holly Dennett has a good set of instructions on a pin hem, and we'll link that one in our show notes. So we started with some of our favorite hemming techniques, but they aren't necessarily the most common, are they, Tracy? <laughs> That's right. A double folded hem is the simplest and most common type of hem in sewing, where you press up the seam allowance and then fold up and press again so that you have a double fold and then stitch close to the fold. With a hem like this, sometimes it helps to run a line of stitching at the first fold line to help you fold up accurately. Or you can use a hemming tool. For example, the Generates Silicon Hemmer is really cool and works really nicely for straight edges. But it isn't um, as a technique for a double folded hem. It's not ideal, really, for curved hems. That's incredibly clever, Tracy. I took a look at that and it's like, oh, 
I, I do like to always use chalk and markers to try to execute a perfect hem. But when it comes to curved hems, I'm always just marking it and then praying it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, curved hems. Um, a great technique I saw for handling curved hems recently was to run a gathering stitch along the hemline so you can mm-hmm. gather it slightly and then press the raw edge. Um and maybe we'll put a link to that in a in the show notes as well. Ooh, so that's that's similar, I guess, to how you might do like a sleeve head or help adjust and add ease. That's a great tip when I'm thinking yeah. about that in my head. Um, and if anyone doesn't know what a gathering stitch is, it's just the widest stitch on your machine. If you leave one thread extra long, you can pull it gently and gather your fabric together uh, without breaking that stitch. I was doing French seams on a curve for a silk organza the jacket I was working on. And now I'm very much wishing I knew about this technique because it ended up being some very, very strange. <laughs> I mean, they're there, but they could have benefited from a little bit of a, a gathering along the curve before I, yeah. I stitched them. Well, speaking of jackets, you can have so much fun embellishing hems. Feathers, bobble hems, scallop hems, ruffles, ribbon, or decorative trimmed hems, decorative stitches. Stitches. Oh, yes. You can even make your own embellishments as a crocheter. I do love a good crochet detail a la Chanel for your, for your own garments. And the ribbon and decorative hems. Stitch the, r- the wrong sides together. Trim it. Press the trim to the right front of the garment and top stitch it in place. And for a feather trim, it depends on how secure or fluffy or flowy you want it to be on some high end garments. So, for example, Taller Marbo have the most fabulous feather trim dresses. Um, mm-hmm. They are on a bias strip, which is secured every couple of inches, one to two inches, and it allows them to be easily removed and it gives more fluidity to the garment. That's so brilliant, Tracy. And if I if I remember correctly, we saw that when we were in one of the shops that we visited, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's something we talked about a lot and the importance of, of actually seeing garments in person in our last episode on finding inspiration. Yep, that's right. I found it so interesting because I'd already made the dress with orange <laughs> feathers on the hem inspired by one of their dresses but I hadn't seen it in real life and it it was just really interesting to see how it was put together that dress I took it to the dry cleaners after after I wore it and they made me agree to a disclaimer because there's no there was no label in the garment oh no but it turned out all right it survived I hope oh uh, yeah yeah it did oh good I was looking up hemming techniques on the internet. And of course, there's lots of videos on hemming by hand. And technically, you can do pretty much any of the techniques that we listed with a simple needle and thread. In the couture world, for example, a blind hem is always done by hand. And instead of a teeny pinprick stitch that your machine creates, the hem is completely invisible as it will only be grabbing the fibers on the inside of the fabric rather than going all the way through to the other side. That's so true. There are lots of easy ways to work with hand sewn hems as well. All you need is a single thread in your needle and to make sure your raw edge is enclosed. If you have an overlocker, you can enclose the seam that way. Or if your hem is a double fold or a blind hem, you can simply press the raw edge and make sure it's within your stitch line and then no further finishing is necessary. Tracy, I saw a hack for jeans on YouTube where you just hand stitch the old hem to the upper part of the pant leg and press the excess upward. And I thought that was pretty clever. Oh, Indeed, as long as you don't have too much extra fabric to work with, in which case cutting it and enclosing it then is probably a better strategy. Yeah, agreed. My most recent hemming challenge was actually a pair of crocheted open weave pants I got for the vacation season, which absolutely sent us down a rabbit hole looking at knit and jersey hems, didn't it, Tracy? (laughs) Yes, knit and jersey hems definitely have their own complications, but they are also exceptional candidates for really easy hem techniques. That's right. They're often perfect candidates for a surge hem if you have a serger, which I do not, or a zigzagged hem for the rest of us for an easy finish with a bit of stretch. And often you don't need to worry about fraying with knits, so you don't need to enclose the raw seam. Um, as in you only need to turn up the hem once. Although if it's a really lightweight knit, it's definitely worth stabilizing the seam. 
I would say, unless you have a professional finishing machine for jersey or knits, if you're doing a simple turn under hem on them, you will absolutely want a stabilizer, whether it's a bias binding or even clear elastic. This is an issue I've run into personally multiple times dealing with terry toweling that has some stretch to it. It loves to stretch out while you're sewing it and while you're cutting it. So stabilizing that hem is crucial, especially on a curve. The best hem finishes on a knit are achieved by a cover stitch machine. I don't have one of those. <laughs> but I think if you sew with a lot of stretchy knits, it's a worthwhile um, investment. Yes, we do know someone with one of those, don't we, Tracy? <laughs> so what can we do, though, if to achieve a professional finish without a cover stitch machine? Well, a twin needle is a really good trick. You can use a twin mm-hmm. needle on your sewing machine and it creates two parallel stitches, mimicking the effect that you would see from a cover stitch. You thread the first reel of thread as normal and the second one is either on the bobbin thread or it's on an extra spool pin. When you sew a straight stitch this way, you'll get parallel stitching on the top of the fabric and a zigzag on the back. And this is definitely one to practice first to make sure you've got it (laughs) threaded up correctly. (laughs) You know, what's so funny, Tracy, is I've actually done this technique before on my singer um, as an upholstery technique for my reupholstering my couch. Mm. And I didn't realize it was zigzag until I saw the back of it. (laughs) It is a very, very stable seam. I'll give you that. And I'm definitely going to need to try that with knit sometime soon. And one of the most common hem finishes that we're familiar with on jerseys and knits is fabric bands like the cuff on your joggy bottoms or uh, on your hoodie. This makes so much sense to me because you're taking a stretch fabric and finishing it with another stretch fabric, which are at least one of them is sewn with a slightly stretched shape so that everything just stretches back into place when you're done. I also love the look of a rib finish. Have you used that before in any of your hems, Tracy? Yes, I've used um, ribbing as well on bottoms of like sweatshirts and things. And it, it does look really lovely, especially mm-hmm. when you get the color match perfectly. It's really a really nice thing to use. And my machine has also got this um, triple straight stitch, which is really great for top stitching hems or knits as well. And how does that differ from the twin needle, Tracy? Well, it creates like three little stitches um, next on top of each other. It creates like this bold stitch finish, I think, and it just looks quite nice. Another technique for lightweight knits that you probably all know without realizing it is a lettuce hem. Uh, It's been really popular these last few years with the early 2000s resurgence. The hem is accomplished using a serger usually by actually using the rolled hem technique. The hem is usually used externally on the garments. You can see it and it creates a wavy rippled hem intentionally. Uh, So it's generally considered a design detail. Have you ever used a lettuce hem, Tracy? Uh, Once, I think. There was this cute detail on a jumper dress that I made for my niece um, with some like jersey scraps. It was the Ikashi jasmine sweatshirt and dress I think and it had this armhole ruffle and I'm pretty sure that was made with a lettuce hem I recall it took a good few attempts to get the ruffle to look good but since then I've got a bit hang of threading and changing the settings on my overlockers so maybe I should give it (laughs) any other wavy hem though hasn't been the intended outcome (laughs) (laughs) then we call it a design feature gosh well we've shared all of our favorite hemming techniques but I'm sure you have some tricks Tracy for how we might go about getting the perfect hem yes so Firstly, when working with drapey fabrics like viscose or silk, it's important how you handle them when you're making your garment. Make sure you cut accurately against the grain line and make sure any bias seams like the neckline are stay stitched before you start handling the garment. This isn't going to fix your hemming totally, but it will reduce some of the wonky hem lines. <laughs> this is actually a really important tip for knits as well. You know, I keep <laughs> mentioning that terry cloth romper that I had to fix this year, and that was one of the same issues that I could have avoided. Great tip, Tracy. Also, when working with bias cut skirts or circular garments, like a big full circle skirt, you must hang your garment for a day or so before hemming allowing it time to drop before you hem it ideally on a dress form but failing that on a hanger and making sure it's evenly placed on the hanger and you'll notice that with it depends on the fabric it'll drop a lot or a little and you'll also find different parts of the garment will drop different amounts once it's settled then you'll want to level it off. I had no idea that was a thing. How interesting. (laughs) That's something I, I think I probably should do more of because it makes sense that they kind of settle 
Yeah, especially like, you know, certain fabrics. Like if you're working with more solid, like stable fabrics, it's less of a thing. Yeah, but even like if you've been ironing anything a lot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, it'll still yeah. kind of find its own shape again. Yeah. Well, this is where a dress form or a helpful sewing friend is really useful. So for skirts and dresses, you either want to mock the hem on you, the wearer, or a version of yourself, the dress form. Um, <laughs> for tops and trousers, it's a bit easier to do it on the flat. So if you're wearing the dress or the skirt, wear it with or without shoes. I think there's conflicting advice on this. I, I guess it depends on the length of it and how you intend to wear it. Um, so if it's occasion wear and you know the footwear you want to wear it with, then absolutely have it with the shoes. But if it's an everyday dress that you're going to wear with a variety of footwear, it probably makes sense to hem it barefoot. So I've always heard that unless you're planning on wearing something barefoot, I always have hemmed it with some sort of footwear that you uh. might wear it with, um, especially for like any pants or trousers, but even for kind of like the shape of your backside, I guess, as well with a dress and a skirt uh, yeah. when it's being hemmed. So fun fact, um, back when I worked for a major retailer straight out of college, I spent a lot of time watching alterations happen. Yeah. And um, a quick tip that I learned is that even if you pre-wash your pants, they still might shrink up a little bit over time. So I've always learned to hem slightly longer than you think you want with the length. And usually you will it will shrink up to exactly the length that you want over time. I also have a pair of platform clogs that are only a few centimeters high. And I find they're the perfect length for pretty much everything that I want hemmed. Um, flats aren't too far distant from uh, the pitch of them and neither are heels. So they are my go-to hemming shoes to be wearing <laughs> whenever I'm hemming anything. <laughs> and that way with like trousers, the pants aren't too long for sneakers. If I do want to wear them with something a little bit flatter, or and they're not too short for heels either so that's my perfect hemming shoes so there we go fine, who, who knew that's, that's yeah. what we all need hemming <laughs> shoes <laughs> and then uh, shoes that have hem the garment for you as well <laughs> so to get the perfect hem you can use a ruler stick a measure from the ground up popping pins along the along or a chalk line evenly along along where you want the hem or your dress form may have a marker where you can mark the proposed hemline by sliding a pin through the slot of the marker or you can <laughs> use a vintage pinnet hemmer which is essentially an upright wooden ruler with a metal clip on the edge that you can adjust um based on the height you want it from the floor and it allows you to evenly put a pin along the hem again you need a sewing friend for this one um, and there's also a chalk hem marker, which is again an upright ruler on a stand, and it I think it blows puffs of chalk along the accurate hemline. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't have a sewing friend, roommate, or partner that you live you live with, I enlist my husband quite often, and he complains about how challenging it is all the time. <laughs> I am also a fan of pinning in the mirror and adjusting. Sometimes it's just the only strategy available. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I read or heard somewhere about a trick where you put a piece of string evenly across the door frame and, and chalk it and walk into the line. <laughs> I haven't tried that though. <laughs> I like that technique. That sounds fun. It sounds <laughs> messy. To try that. <laughs> <laughs> Another trick, um, trick with a dress form is to lower the height of it so that the bottom of the hem hits the floor. Or, I mean, you could put it on a table, which is a good way to ensure it's even. <laughs> mm, absolutely. My only caveat, I would say, with off the body hemming would be that our bodies aren't always perfectly symmetrical. So if I'm doing a hem flat or off of the body on the dress form, I always like to double check any kind of perfectly even hem that I do on my body to just see, is one leg longer? Does my derriere perhaps take up a little bit more of the skirt on one side than the other, that kind of thing. How was the hemming experience on your ascot dress, Tracy? Well, I wanted a curved hem, so one that's longer at the back and shorter at the front. And I just factored mm. that into the pattern. Um, but to check it on the end dress, like I let it sit on the mannequin for a day and 
Then I measured from the centre back to the centre front on both sides, checking that the hem increased evenly <laughs> as I moved both sides towards the centre front. Wow, I love that meticulous attention to detail. <laughs> Knowledge of how to hem garments properly for your fabric is great for anyone that makes garments from scratch, but it also can be a fabulous entryway into sewing for anyone who wants to maximize the wear and fit of their existing wardrobe. Absolutely. The techniques you can use to rehem or alter a garment are generally similar, but we wanted to share a few exceptions, namely knitwear, denim, and lengthening garments. First up for knitwear, the easiest way to hem a knitted garment is always going to be on a machine with a knitwear-friendly hem technique, as we discussed earlier. One key thing to think about that might be a bit different from other hemming projects is you're much more likely to have an uneven starting hem depending on on the weight of the knit, especially if you're cutting it with scissors, which is often kind of the directions when you're dealing with a pre-existing knit. So shorten that piece of knitwear to a length that's a little bit longer than your desired hem and actually try to unravel one full line of the weave so that you get an even edge to work with. This will make the hemming process infinitely easier, whether you're using a standard machine or a serger. And as we mentioned earlier, for rehemming looser, woven or knitted fabrics, stabilization is key. So don't be afraid to use bias tape or even a clear elastic to hold the shape of the new hem. Another fun thing that I learned over the years is that if you have a decorative hem but want to shorten something, you can always reattach the original hem at a new length. Yeah. To do that, you do need to cut a little bit of extra fabric to be able to refinish the top portion of the new hem to the new hem bottom, if that makes sense. But yeah. then you can use the embellished hem techniques to reattach that detail. And lastly, if you're lengthening a hem, make sure to use a seam ripper to unpick the hem so that you can preserve as much fabric as possible for your new hem. Try your best to replicate the original technique. But when you are running low on fabric, don't be afraid to just use a bit of bias tape to create a clean, supported hem. Wow, there are so many great techniques and tricks to achieve the perfect hem, Tracy. Lots of resources as well. Yes, and whilst Google is your friend <laughs> for <laughs> hemming techniques, some of the old school sewing books are best, like Reader's Digest, Complete Guide to Sewing, or the Vogue Sewing Book. And your sewing mm. machine manual and your overlocker manual will also give step-by-step -step instructions for how to sew some of the special hems that we've discussed today. Or like me, you can discover that some of the feet that you may already own for your machine are actually specialized hemming techniques. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite hemming resource books that I, I can't remember who recommended it to me, but they specifically said this is one of the best books for working with knits. It's called Sewing with Knits, Classic Stylish Garments from Swimsuits to Evening Wear by Connie Long. It may be the ex-ballerina in me that makes <laughs> me partial to their choices in that book, but I think if you can teach people how to sew dance clothing and accessories and knitwear all together, you can pretty much sew anything. There's a table in that book that's organized by fabric type that recommends seaming, hemming, and neckline finishing techniques that is so very useful. Just kind of point and click and pick which technique is best suited for your fabric and fits with what your project is trying to accomplish. So many options. Oh, wow. Yep, agreed. So now, Rebecca, when it comes to high fashion, is there anything different you think when considering how hemming is done? Great question, Tracy. When we think of high fashion garments, hemming techniques are usually determined by one of two factors, craftsmanship or design. By that, I mean a designer may finish a hem a certain way simply because it's the most elegant way to do it without adding any visual interest to the garment, such as in couture pieces. In other instances, the hem can actually assist in achieving the design itself, and that can be the motivation for the style choice. And Tracy, we talked about a great example of this the other week during con when Natalie Portman wore a recreation of Dior's famous Junon dress with the beaded, almost petal-like skirt. It was absolutely incredible. Yeah, such a, like such a beautiful dress. Incredible. It was absolutely stunning. 
the shape of the petals on the skirt is actually achieved using horsehair on the hemline, providing stiffness and that structure. And it's a great example of trying to achieve the design vision being the driving factor behind the choice of how to finish the hemline. So inspiring. It, it really is. I'm, I'm tempted to attempt some sort of crinoline hemline next in order to experiment a bit more with the concept. But that that brings us to our final topic, Tracy, which is what are you working on next? Well, well, I think I want some quick sews <laughs> now after spending so long on one dress. You so um, <laughs> I think some summer dresses are calling out. What about you, Rebecca? That sounds lovely. Well, I do need to work through some uh, projects that I have sitting on my shelves, but I also want to tackle something before our next episode that is fully on theme, which is potentially going back to making a uh, full couture jacket. Yeah. (laughs) Which brings us to the theme for our next episode, which is going to be... Couture jacket making, reflecting on one year since the course that we met at covering couture jacket techniques and skills and how we've applied them in our makes. I'm so excited, Tracy. And before our next episode, if you have any thoughts, ideas, or questions for us, you can always find us on social media at Threaded Together Podcast. And all of our show notes and links can also be found on threadedtogetherpodcast.com. In the meantime, I'm Tracy. And I'm Rebecca. And this has been Threaded Together Podcast. (laughs) Looking forward to our next episode in a month. Make sure you give us a thumbs up on Apple Podcasts or follow us on Spotify. You can find more details on what we discussed today in the show notes below or on threadedtogetherpodcast.com. And for more behind the scenes and regular updates, you could always find us on all social channels at Threaded Together Podcast.